If you want to turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, you know, we think what Christ went through 2,000 years ago and how he died on the cross for us and what he did. And it's an amazing thing because the Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. The first Adam messed up. Christ is called the second Adam. In other words, where Christ, where mankind messed up, Christ came and took our place on the cross. And it's an amazing thing that Christ has done for us because what he did for us is he not only paid for our sins, but he also paid for us to be able to be in contact with God. And so I'm gonna look at the last um, seven words of Jesus and we'll have an opportunity to pray together. If you remember what took place, that Jesus, just the night before, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew what was gonna take place. And he was preparing himself and trying to warn his disciples what was going to happen. That he was going to have to face death and he's going to have to face difficulty and that they'd have to be ready. And he asked us to watch and pray that you would not enter into temptation. And he would go away from a stone's throw that said, and he got down and he prayed, Father, if there's any other way to do this, let me know. And he finally said, no, not my will be done, but your will be done. And so what's so amazing about it is how God so loved us so much that he did this for us. And so if you want to just go ahead and look at Luke chapter uh, 33, 23, excuse me. He says the following when he goes to the cross. If they put him on the cross, they nail him to the cross. And I don't know if you recognize this, but the, it's one of the most hor horrific punishments known to man. And the amazing part of it, the Bible never talks about the, the suffering and the misery he experienced with the physical aspects of things. Instead, we hear about the emotional and the spiritual um, difficulties that Christ had to go through instead. And so uh, they say it's one of the most painful things you can do. I don't know if you recognize it, but there's been reports on it. What has happened is they have these, almost like a sciatic nerve, kind of like that, uh, they put a nail through you. It just goes through your entire body. The 39 lashes he went through would normally kill somebody. And he was extraordinarily, went through extraordinarily misery but really, the, probably the worst part for Christ was before he went to the cross, was in that garden. And the Bible says that he almost sweat, like um, his, his sweat and blood mixed together. And, and psychologists and doctors tell us today, well, you're under great duress and great anxiety. It can come to a place that your capillaries burst because of the anxiety, and it mixed with his sweat. And so Jesus understands what it feels like to go through, um, yes, see, I think he had some anxiety about it. You don't get that way without anxiety. You see, but besides the anxiety, he still did the right thing. He did what God called him to do. And the Bible says he battled and he battled and he battled. And then it says the angels gave him comfort and he went through all the things. And sometimes people think that Jesus, they said, it doesn't make any sense. How can a bunch of crowds say, Hosanna, Hosanna, here comes the king of kings, and the following week they crucified him. But the truth is, I don't know if you realize this, but when they arrested Jesus, they did it at night when people were sleeping. And they did all the stuff at night, and by the time the folks woke up in the morning, it was already too late. The process began. So the people weren't as fickle as you think. And so Jesus was that, and he was the lamb that takes away the sins of the earth. And just as the Passover, if you think about Passover, it's an amazing thing. If you were here for the Seder dinner, we talked about how the Passover lamb, if you go back to the Israelites, and how they took that, that sacrificial lamb, that spotless lamb, they took hyssop, the branch of hyssop, and they put it over the doorpost. They put it in the top and the sides, almost like a cross. And as the angel of death passed through, if you had that blood upon you, you were saved. And in many ways, that's what Christ is. Behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the earth. And so here, here he is, extraordinary pain, suffering, dehydrated, uh, by himself, betrayed by his friends, hanging on a cross. One of the most torturous things you could do. And the Bible says very clearly, it says, and I was just reading a couple of days ago in the Bible, cursed is anything that hangs on a tree. And here's Jesus hanging on a tree. And so here he is, standing between heaven and earth and each other. It's interesting how the cross does that. The cross brings us between God and man, and it connects us to each other. And so he says in, in Luke 23, 33, it's one of his first words. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's in Luke 23. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
It's an amazing that he's saying, God, Father, forgive him. Here are all the things that are taking place. They're mocking him. They're making fun of him. He has the power to get off the cross. He has power to do all these things. And he says, yet, yeah, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so I'll go ahead and read. You can follow along. I think his scripture should be on the screen. Luke 23, 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the left, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saves others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen God. The soldier also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine. So here they're mocking him. And in the middle of it, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What an amazing thing, that in the middle of persecution, while we were yet sinners, Christ died and he forgives us. He says, Father, forgive them. That's the first thing Christ says on the cross. Isn't that amazing? He wants to forgive us. He wants us to have a relationship with God. The second word he says is found in Luke 23, 39. He says the following, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too. And why you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God, even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I show you that today you will be with me in paradise. And by this time, it was about noon, and darkness began to fall across the whole land till 3 o'clock. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so what an amazing thing. What an amazing peak into heaven to understand that if you are in Christ, you'll be with him in paradise. Today, you'll be with me in paradise, right on the cross. In the middle of his suffering, Jesus is reaching out to somebody else and saying, today, you'll be with me in paradise. And folks, if we will give our lives to Christ, know the fact that we will be with him in paradise. We've seen a lot of death in the last three or four days in our family, my two, un my two aunts died, and my, I just got word that one of my uncles, who's 93, is dying as well. And you hear about all this, but it's so good to know that this is not all there is. That because of what Christ did for us, we have access to him, and that we will be with him in paradise. What an amazing thing. Isn't it amazing to know that? And what's so extraordinary, you think about what happened, is that Jesus took the place of a man called Barabbas, Pontius Pilate tried to get this off his hands. He said, I offer to you Barabbas or Jesus. Barabbas was a notorious uh, political um, prisoner. And what did Jesus do? He took his place of a criminal. You know, that's what Christ has done for us. All of us have sinned. All of us are criminals. None of us are worthy of what Christ has done. And yet Christ says, no, I'll take the place of the criminal and I'll go, and I'll go up. So here you have a criminal on one side, a criminal on the other side. There should have been three criminals that day. But Jesus stood between them both, and one chose life, and one chose death. And this is the same choice we have here today. Every person has that choice, to choose life or to choose death. What's the third word? The third word is this. In the middle of all the suffering, Jesus is thinking of his mother. Started in John chapter 19, verse 25. It says this. Sterning to the cross, Jesus' mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clovis, and Mary Magdalene, who he drove seven demons out of. Isn't that amazing? Here's a woman that was a prostitute, was demon-possessed. And there she is at the cross watching Jesus. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And the disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, his disciple took into his home. And so in the middle of that, Jesus cares about his family. He cares about relationships. He, he asked God to forgive people that are totally against him, and he's also taking care of a criminal and gives him a chance to know Christ at the very last moments of his life. And here we are taking care of his family. The fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's found in Matthew 27 and Mark 15. You know, this is perhaps one of the most profound ones as I did search and looked at it. The, the word used there is the only... Um, Greek tense there, it basically is he screamed out. He screamed out, Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? 
It was, a, it was a loud scream found nowhere else in the New Testament. He was screaming out at the top of his lungs and perhaps his, his greatest pain. He doesn't talk about the nails. He doesn't talk about the crown of thorns. He doesn't talk about his friends running away from him. But I tell you what he talks about. He talks about the fact that God turns his back on Jesus and he has no longer God's presence in his life. And he begins to feel the pangs of hell coming. Total separation from God. Everything good, everything moral, everything right has been removed from him. And now he's there. My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And he's quoting Psalm 22, which talks prophetically about what Christ will happen to Christ. He's screaming out. He doesn't talk about anything else. It's not good to know that Jesus understands what it feels like to be forsaken. He knows He's going to have to be, and the first time in his entire existence, from the creation of time to when he was a baby to now, the presence of Christ was always with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He was always in that perfect unity, and now, for a moment in time, it was going to be broken, and he was going to have to face all the sins of you and I that we've ever done and we will ever do was upon Jesus. I don't think we understand the significance and the pain. You know, in that movie called The Passion, you might have seen it a number of years ago, it really her brutally shows some of the things that took place. And some of it was very accurate. But I don't think it captures the pain and the scream. As I look at this, he screamed out, why have you forsaken me? Now, he knew that Christ was with him. But in his darkest hour, he was quoting Scripture. How important is it? to get Scripture in our hearts. That when we're at our, we're in our wit's end, when life is crushing in on us, he, de he, deeps, he, he goes deep down and he calls out the very Scripture that he has called, the Word became flesh. Why have you forsaken me? And maybe some of you felt that way. Maybe you felt that way if you went through a divorce or a situation where someone you trusted, someone you love, you feel like you're all by yourself. I'll never forget a number of years ago, when I was in graduate school and I was in seminary and all that, uh, or some people say cemetery, it was a good Friday and I was just hanging out and, and I just like, you know, I tried to meditate what was going on and I, I got by myself and I just prayed. I said, God, I don't understand. What did you go through? Now, I'm not suggesting that my experience demonstrates what really happened, but I, I had one of those experiences where all of a sudden I asked God, what did you go through, Jesus? What did you feel like? And I tell you, I, I was the weirdest. I never happened to me before. But all of a sudden I felt darkness come upon me. And all hope was gone. There was no hope. There was no peace. But terror went through my body. And I began to feel extraordinarily afraid, separated. And I went. It was only for about five or six seconds. But as I felt that, I came back out for a second. I said, my God. If that's, I mean, I'm not suggesting for a moment that I had any idea what Jesus went through. But I asked just to have a little bit of a glimpse. And it was extraordinary pain. I had a friend of mine in this church. I don't want to break confidentiality. He had a dream one night that he went to hell. And he said there was no hope. There was, no, you know, in our life, we always think of it, it's going to be a better day tomorrow. Even in the middle of this terrible winter, spring is coming, summer is coming. You always have hope. He said there was absolutely no hope, no comfort. There was no way to think you're going to get through this. And I think maybe that's what Jesus felt like a little bit. Because think about it, when you pull God out of the equation, when you pull God out of your life, there is no hope. There is no peace. Well, if Jesus knew for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Yeah, he endured the cross. But he also endured the powers of hell. And he's on that cross, and he feels forsaken by God. I don't think we understand the gravity of that. I don't think we understand the pain of that. We have no idea. You see, Jesus never felt that before in all of his existence before he became the son of man, when he was in heaven, in the very beginning, he says, let us make man. He was always in the Trinity. They always had that, that, that uh, habitation together. For the very first time, he was not there. By his pain, we're healed. And perhaps one of the most difficult types of pain people face today, it's, it's the kind of spoken pain. It's the pain of depression and anxiety and hopelessness. Jesus understands what that feels like. And he is a remedy of healing for that. Because in him, there's always hope. He became hopeless so we could have hope. 
He became sin that we could know the righteousness of God. So out of everything in the Bible, out of the entire passion narrative, the two places where you see Jesus crying out with extraordinary pain, with extraordinary emotion based upon the language that's presented here and, and the parsing of the Greek and all that, you see it in the garden and you see it on the cross. Those are the two places and those two places have to deal with doing something for the Father and being separated from the Father. My friends, that is amazing when you think about what Jesus went through for us. He experienced the terror of hell. He experienced the terror of not having God. You see, what is hell? I, I mean, I'm not going to talk about it and the fire and all that. Do you know, I think fire and flames is nothing compared to having no God in our lives. Imagine having no hope, no peace, no tomorrow. I mean, nothing to look forward to, nothing of peace, no love, no hope. And Jesus felt that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's amazing when you look at that. And it's amazing when you read Psalm 22, which one of our, one of our folks, uh, Jeffrey Cohen, who is, a, who is a Messianic Jew and a rabbi now, he went and as he read Psalm 22, he realized that this is true and he gave his life to Christ. Because it talked about that. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. The psalm continues. They divided my garments among them. The fifth word. He says, I thirst. So here we have Jesus. The first word he says is, God, forgive these people that are sinning against me. The second word he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. The third word he says, well, take care of my mother the fourth word, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth word, I thirst. And Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there. They soaked it on a sponge with a hyssop branch. And the hyssop branch was the same branch, type of branch used when they took the blood of the lamb. They put it on the door host. It was that, it was that thing that went upon the uh, doorpost through hyssop. And that same hyssop branch went to his lips. The word, spoken word of God that became flesh. And what saves us is Jesus, what he did for us. The word became flesh. The word saves us. Not the Bible, but Jesus Christ, who's the word that became flesh. I thirst. The sixth word. So they put the sponge, soaked it in wine. And then the following, Jesus received it. He said, it is finished. He bowed his head and handed over his spirit. The seventh word. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend or commit my spirit. The light of the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle, and Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Now, what was he saying? Basically, I believe this was happening. I believe that God turned his back on him. And I believe that Jesus said, despite the fact that I cannot feel it, I cannot see it, into your hands I commit my spirit. That he trusts the Father beyond the screaming of his emotions, beyond the screaming of the agony of his physical pain. He says, I commit my spirit into you. It is finished, which is paid in full. The deed has been paid. I have paid for all the sins and all the sicknesses of mankind is paid in full. It is finished. It is done. And ever since that time, there has now been a bridge made from humankind to God. There is now an access point. The Bible says he always stands in intercession. Now, I believe not only does it mean he intercedes for us, but the intercession is that now there is a bridge between us and the Father. No longer does there have to be a veil separating us. No longer once a year does a high priest come in with a sacrifice. Now we are all kingdoms of priests and are able to go before God because of what Christ has done for us. 
It's an amazing thing when you look about that. And so the last seven words of Jesus, and you think about them, they really encompass who he was and what he did for us. And the beauty of it, it does not stop there. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, if he did not rise from the dead, your faith is futile. So we know that he rose again from the dead. But the Bible also says he went into the seal. He went into the, he went into the dark chambers and spoke to those that went before. He went to the place of the dead that we would not have to. There's a lot of different controversy about that, but I want to focus on what he said. Paid in full. There's some scriptures here. Peter says this in 1 Peter 2, 24. He says the following. He himself bore our sins. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. And if it goes, he's quoting, Peter's quoting, basically he's taking the scriptures written 500 years before Christ came. Isaiah had a vision, and he wrote it down, and it is an amazing description of what Christ went through. When you read it, it's like Isaiah was there journaling as a journalist what was taking place. Because he says the following in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. People say, you don't know what I'm going through. No, I don't, but Jesus understands what it is to have grief. Surely he has borne our griefs. Okay, what is grief? Grief is an emotional pain. He has borne our griefs. He's carried away our sorrows. Yet he esteemed him stricken. Smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded. Why? Because of our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, a chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Present tense, continuous action. And, and actually, actually, when Peter talks about it, when it's translated in Greek, it's in, it's in a continuous action. That it's not only now, but it continues on. By his stripes, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all turned, every one of us, his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich. Of course, the Bible says that a rich man bought his tomb for him at his death. Because he had no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put to him grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasures of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I would divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. In other words, he actually said, I am associating with you. And just a little side note for all of us. If you and I want to see salvation come to our families, come to our cities, come to our nation, we're going to need to associate with it. Not say those people, say us. If you read the Daniel prayer in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel says, we have sinned. We have turned away. And if we're going to see God listen to our prayers, we have to be like Jesus and be willing to be numbered with the transgressors. 
and say, Father, I am not better than this society. I am an American, and we're turning away from you. I am a part of the family, and our family is our families turned away from you. God, I pray you touch our family. Christ was numbered with the transgressors. That's an amazing thing, that Christ, if there's anyone that would say, I'm not part of those people, it would be Jesus. But what did he do? He, a power of association, he became part of us. He associated himself with us. Listen, if you and I are going to see our families change, for those that don't know Christ, if we want to see our society change, I don't know about you, this is a little side note, I'm really grieved when I read the news, what's going on, and hear what's going on. I'm like, God, someone's got to stand up. I feel like God said, why don't you stand up? But who am I, God? Who am I to stand up? Be numbered with the transgressors. Take personal responsibility for the land that you placed you in. Take personal responsibility for your family. Take personal responsibility and be willing to be numbered with the transgressors. You see, you only, can, only when you're willing to be numbered with the transgressors is the Spirit of Christ really on you. If we always have the idea that we're higher, that we're better, that we're stronger than somebody else then that's the, not the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ gets down into the dirt. The Spirit of Christ becomes nothing that others would become something. My friends, that is the Spirit that is so powerful that nothing can stop it. A religious spirit thinks it's better. Let me help you that you're so low. God got so low that he went so high. You know, ultimately, you know, we're talking about healing. I can't think of a better healing than that. That my spirit and your spirit is resurrected to be with Christ. To know that no matter what takes place, that we're going to be with him forever and ever and ever. And you know what? Jesus went through all this pain that others could cross the bridge as well. My friends, it's not time for us to huddle together and hope he comes back quickly. No, it's time for us to say, there's a lost and dying world. God, give us passion for the people that they don't know what they're doing. And let us be numbered with them, Father. Let us associate with them to bring them back to you. That's the spirit of healing that Christ wants to bring. I can't think of a better healing than that. And I want to encourage you. You know, uh, one of the times you can invite people to church is Christmas, Easter, funerals, and weddings. Invite folks to come. They're going to hear the gospel message on Sunday. Why not take him to church? Hey, listen, just come. Love on them. Let them hear the gospel message. They'll come. And you know what? God will work on their hearts. Even if they don't respond to the gospel, seeds have been dropped. Do you realize that? And when we have the attitude that I really care about you, that I'm with you, I'm numbered with you, there's such power in that. Because that's love. Willing to lay down his life for us. And that's what Christ did for us. So as we look at that, it's extraordinary. We read, by his stripes we are healed. The Bible says, bless the Lord all my soul. You see in your bulletin, who what? Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Why is it that we're okay with Christ God forgiving our sins but not healing our diseases? Let me ask you a question today. Everyone you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with, and if you share, your, you know, you can share the story of Christ to help others come to know him. Maybe you don't know who Christ is, but hopefully you've been heard about the Christ story. Does everyone you share the gospel with come to Christ? No. Oh, it must not be for today. We're not gonna, I'm not going to share the gospel anymore. Not everyone comes to Christ. If it, was for, if it was for that, what does the Bible say? He wants none to perish, but all to come to faith, as Peter talks about. So, bless the Lord of my soul, who, who, it's in this, if you put that scripture up, who heals all your diseases and forgives all your sins. So, if we're so willing, why not pray for those that are sick? Why not ask God to pray for somebody? Say, can I pray for you? Say, I'm praying for you. You know, we've seen extraordinary, I believe God's going to heal people tonight. I do, I believe that. And uh, I believe that he's going to heal us. He's going to heal us maybe inside, maybe our emotions, maybe our spirits. Perhaps the greatest healing of all can take place. Maybe you have not given your life to Christ, but you're a fan of Christianity. You like Christian philosophy. You like church, but you've never laid your life down. That's the greatest healing of all. But I also believe God is a God that can heal. We've seen tremendous healings in the last, uh, last month. I got Mary House is standing on the chair back. She couldn't do that. She's doing the camera for us. Thank you, Mary. 
Now she's back at the shopping malls running around. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But God touched her, you know? I mean, I, I mean, I saw her. She couldn't do it, and God healed her. God healed David Young, who's at home helping us with the web stream right now. We've seen a guy named Jeff a couple of years ago had back trouble, and he said, Pastor, I don't want to go. I'm tired of being prayed for. I said, maybe tonight's your night. And he got healed, and even to this day, he's still healed. God does stuff like that. God heals. We saw someone with scoliosis who was healed. Uh, I've seen my, my dad had a valve problem and was healed. And we, we've seen through our family, through the life, God touching us. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God that heals even today when we call upon his name. If we believe and reach out to him. It says in the Bible in Mark 16, 17 through 18, these signs will follow those who believe. I'm going to ask if seven to make his way out. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents and drink anything deadly. It would by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Ushers, please bring out the snakes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I had to throw it in there. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> James 5:13. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready for uh, this time for, I just call it Thanksgiving because that's really what it is. We thank God for giving, for communion at this time. I just want to, you know, I believe that healing comes in the atonement. What does atonement mean? Atonement is the payment of Christ. It's what Christ has done for us. Healing is available to us today. Can I turn it on like a faucet? No. Can I control it? No. But what you can do is ask and believe. And I believe God is going to touch some people here tonight. I do believe that. The first thing I would like to do tonight is this. For those of you watching at home or, or watching later on, go ahead and pass up the elements if you could be so kind and just hold on to the elements. You know, Jesus did something extraordinary that night, and he didn't finish the last cup, by the way. When he comes back, it'll be the last cup. But Jesus took his bread and said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Jesus understands brokenness. He understands what it feels like to be betrayed. He understands loss. He understands depression. He understands anxiety. He understands hopelessness. When you wake up in the morning, you can't see the light of another day. He understands that. The Bible says he's been tempted in every capacity that you and I have, yet he did not sin. You see, sometimes we beat ourselves up for experiencing things and thinking that's sin. No. You may experience stuff, but if you give in to it, and Jesus did not give in to that sin, and he was broken for us. I, don't, I want to pray right now. I just want to take a moment to pray. Take a moment right now to pray for broken hearts. Maybe some of you have broken hearts. Maybe that divorce that you went through, you never quite healed up from that. Maybe that situation with your parents, you've never gotten over. Maybe that job, you, you, that dream job you thought you had, and you never quite got back to where you were before. You know, I want to pray. Uh, I know a person that just lost a, a, uh, their, their child to suicide. It's been heavy in my heart. I want to pray for that person as well and her, her family. Can you imagine what it feels like to go through that? Christ was broken for us. I'm going to take a moment to pray for the healing of emotions and disappointment. Father, I want to thank you for Jesus Christ. 
you spared nothing. God, you could have given us anything. You could have made another being for us, but no. You didn't give us another person. You didn't give us a thing. You gave us yourself through Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray right now that you'd bring healing upon emotions right now, God. I pray you'd heal broken hearts right now. And as I'm, as I'm praying right now, I just, uh, a couple things that need to be done here. First of all, it says in the book of James, it talks about prayer of faith, and if he committed sins, he would not be forgiven. He will, he will be forgiven. One of the greatest hindrances to healing in your body, healing in your spirit, is unforgiveness. Everything, the whole cross, the whole passion story, everything Jesus did and does is forgiveness. Without forgiveness, there's no hope for any of us. So it could it be the reason why you can't break out of your depression or difficulty, whatever it is, is you're not forgiven somebody. Ask the Lord. You know, I say this all the time because it's something I have, I have the opportunity, and probably you do too, I have the opportunity to practice forgiveness all the time. It's a, it's a lovely thing I get to practice all the time. And every time I get a little bit smug or self-righteous, God goes, hey, wait, wait a minute here. I forgave you. Remember that? Oh, yeah, God. All right. oh, wait, wait. No, well, God, you don't remember my sins. No, but the devil does. But I'm going to turn it around on him. <laughs> When I think about what I've done and how gracious he's been and when I think about who I am without Christ, listen, without forgiveness, there's no healing. Without forgiveness, there's, the cross is meaningless without forgiveness. It's all about forgiveness. As I've forgiven you, so forgive each other. Jesus says after the Beatitudes, he says after the Lord's Prayer, he says if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, God will not forgive you. If God doesn't forgive you, that means his blood's not on you. I don't know what the circumstance. Do you want to play with that? I don't. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, many of you have not discerned the body correctly and have, have, have eaten judgment upon yourselves. And so before we take this, I'm going to ask you, do you have any unforgiveness towards anybody in your, in your life? Perhaps the, the most difficult person to forgive sometimes is yourself. And there's this crazy, super spiritual nonsense that that's spiritual, that I hate myself. No, that's a monastic nonsense. I'm not saying monks do that, but I'm saying it is, it is taking this self-hatred, really. No, even what you've done, God can forgive you. There's no healing without forgiveness. So you know what? There's no sense even praying for anybody until we deal with this issue. Do you have any unforgiveness in your heart? Do you have any unforgiveness towards yourself, towards a spouse, towards a loved one? Take a moment right now. I don't know if this is me or the Lord, but I just sense someone... Either uh, someone here has went through an abortion and it's always been something that you just can never seem to let go. You know, God forgives, but you just have a hard time forgiving yourself. Know that God can even forgive abortion. I don't know if that's anyone here or someone watching or, or what, but I just, if that's you today, just receive it today. God forgives you if you confess it to him. And I also want to give an opportunity if you give your life to Christ. It's not enough just to know about Christ. You have to give your life to Christ and say, God, I'm no longer just going to believe in you. I give my life to you. Until you give your life to Christ, there's no bridge to cross. That's, what, that's, the, that's the pass. You can't save yourself, but the one thing he requires is that you give him everything. You give him your two cents in your pocket, and he'll give you trillions of dollars back. But until, as long as you hold on to it, you cannot receive him. If your hands are grasped like this, you can't receive and you have to say, I give it all to Christ. So if you're willing to do I'm going to pray a prayer right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I turn my life over to you today. 
I ask you to forgive me of all the sins I've done. I ask you to forgive me for perhaps a secret abortion that I participated in or I was a part of. For any other sins I've done, I ask you to forgive me right now. I thank you that what you did on the cross is enough. So, Lord, I hand over in faith my sins to you, and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and wash me of my sins. Thank you that what you did on the cross is and was and continues to be enough. I ask you to fill me with your presence now, and I give my life to you. I give you everything. I willingly hand over my life and say, Father, no longer is it my life. It is your life. And with your help and with your grace, I will walk with you from this day forward. If you prayed that prayer today, it's a new beginning. I want to continue to pray right now. Father, I just pray for anyone else that is suffering right now from depression, from a broken spirit. Lord, I pray you'd heal right now. I pray you'd heal any anxiety, any depression that the doctors basically said you're going to have to be on this medication for the rest of your life. Understand that the doctor does not have the last word. God has the last word. So, Father, I pray you'd touch, touch those right now that are suffering from anxiety and depression in Jesus' name. Just maybe you want to place your hand or whatever on your stomach or your head or whatever, just pray. Father, I just pray right now that you'd heal people that are suffering from anxiety, from depression, from OCD, from bipolar, from any mental difficulty in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that the crown of thorns were placed upon your head. We want to thank you, Jesus. You experienced the depth of emotional pain, and you walked out the other side healed of it. Father, you took it for us. Lord, you were cursed for us. And Lord, I pray right now for a healing for those that are suffering from any kind of mental issues, from emotional problems. In Jesus' name. For Parkinson's disease, in Jesus' name. You have Parkinson's disease. Just receive it right now in Jesus' name. Receive healing right now. Lord, receive your healing, Lord God. I pray you begin to show people that you're touching them right now in Jesus' name. If someone, if you, I don't know if this is me or not, but if you have a little, like a burning in your stomach right now, I think the Lord is touching you of this depression right now. I just want you to receive it in Jesus' name. We had a person that we prayed for. I gave a call out. They can stop smoking. They haven't smoked since. Two people. So sometimes I get impressions and people say, well, how does that work out? Well, when you read the Bible, you know how you read the Bible? Sometimes something jumps off the page and speaks to you. Okay? It happens to everybody if you read the Bible. Sometimes I'll be up here and I'll just, like I'm reading the Bible, I'll feel something come up and I'll just say it and I'll release it in faith. Someone will take it and they'll be healed. And some of you are thinking, well, how come God can't heal my leg? Well, you know what? Take it today. Maybe God can heal your leg right now. So Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray for healing right now to go through this room to touch every heart. In Jesus' name, to touch every mind, to touch every body. In Jesus' name. Lord, pray for backs to be healed right now. In Jesus' name. For backs to be made well right now. In Jesus' name. Pray for glaucoma to be healed. And Lord, I even pray for cancer, God. Lord, we're afraid to pray for that because we don't, it's such a deadly disease. But Father, cancer and a common cold is no different for you to heal. And so, Father, we're praying right now. I pray for Annabal Medina right now, in Jesus' name, wherever he is. If he's watching, if he's listening, if he watches later, we ask you to touch him right now, in Jesus' name. Father, you're able to do it. Lord, you have not because you ask not. So, Father, we're going to keep knocking. We're going to keep asking. We're going to continue on and on and on. We're going to continue to petition you, Father, that you would heal him, Lord, that you go through his body, that every cancer cell would be destroyed and replaced by good cells in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. You're able to do it. And, Lord, we thank you. We worship you because of who you are and what you do. And we worship you because of who we are in you forever and ever and ever. And I ask your healing touch to be upon him in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, be made whole right now. Thank you, Father. Pray for arthritis to be healed right now in Jesus' name. For joint issues to be healed right now in Jesus' name.
Jesus' name. Just receive his healing today. I don't know, maybe this is a sense that maybe someone is scared because your memory's going away, and you're thinking, oh no, am I going to have what my mother and father had? I just, just, I just wanted to say that's not of God. I just pray right now for people that are struggling, worried about dementia. I, I pray, Father, I just pray for healing for that as well, in Jesus' name. Lord, I just pray for your grace to be upon us all, in Jesus' name. Jesus said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. I want you to think whatever is broken in your life. Just lift it to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you you were broken that we could be made whole. In Jesus' name. Take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. After they supped, he took his blood. We represented his blood. So take, drink all of you. This is my blood, which has been shed for you. Let's all stand if we could. Thank you, Jesus. Can we sing that song, I believe? Thank you, Father. We just bless you today. In Jesus' name. teams that have been asked to come down, they come down. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to encourage you to come down. We will pray with you. We're anointed with oil. We'll pray for you. If you feel you've been touched and you feel you've been healed, come on down. But we're going to pray for you as we continue to sing the songs. We're going to come and we're going to pray for each other. We're going to ask God to touch you. Go ahead. I believe you're my healer. I believe Anyone who wants prayer, please come on down. We'll pray. We'll stay as long as it takes.
else need any prayer please come forward we'd love to pray with you if you have any testimonies you feel the lord's touch you let us know otherwise we're just going to allow it if you want to go you can we're going to open keep it open for prayer but if you want to go you can go we hope to see you easter sunday otherwise just enjoy the, the worship time
Turn your 